Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. And on this edition of the podcast, I have the pleasure of speaking with one of the most prolific, innovative, and decorated men in the knife industry. The world knows him for his iconic designs and inventions. You know him as a master knife maker and designer who's had hundreds of folders, fixed blades, machetes, etc. in production with CRKT, Kershaw, WorkSharp, and ZT. There, I gave it away. And uh, in speaking with him on the phone, it became obvious that Ken Onion is a wealth of experience and insight and a priceless resource to knife makers at all stages of their career. And I'm really happy that it brings him here to the podcast. Uh, and speaking of phones, uh, let us know what you think. Call the listener line, 724-466-4487. I'm telling you this so you can unburden yourself. I know you're the type who finds every excuse to inject knife talk into average everyday conversations. And I'm begging you, save those relationships and work it all out on the listener line. Tell us what you think. What's your favorite knife? Who's your favorite designer? What are you carrying? What are you looking forward to? Maybe you have a stupid knife story to get off your chest. I have many. Or maybe you have a comment to make on an interview like the one we bring you today. So bottom line, let us know what's on your knife mind. Call us on the listener line, 724-466-4487, and we'll play it on the show. And now, without further plugging, I bring you Ken Onion. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. Ken, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. I've had uh, I've had many of your knives through the years, uh, um, and and actually, since I have you here, I have to show you the one that I carry the most, and that is my Zero 0200 from ZT. It is right up my alley, and I have always loved this knife, sir. So it's a, it's a pleasure to show you mine, if you will. Thank you. Oh, you yeah. know, that handle is the same as the 0100. Is it? Oh, the, uh, the fixed blade. blade. Right. That was meant to be kind of like, you know, if a guy's in the field, he doesn't have to get accustomed to two different grips. Right. If you're used to using your fixed blade all the time, or for whatever reason, it's not available. You grab the folder. Didn't want it to feel awkward. Yeah, this is one of the most hand-filling and comfortable uh, handles out there. Uh, but then again, you're known for your ergonomics and other things like that. Uh, in doing a little bit of research for our interview today, I was uh, looking at some other interviews, and something struck me. Uh, as a boy, you would collect pocket knives. You grew up on a farm and you used and needed pocket knives and you would collect them. And, and one thing that fascinated you was these old used knives had ding and wear and weather. And you saw a story in that. They had history rubbed into them. You know, think about it. If that knife could tell a story, what story would it tell? See, that was always very romantic to me. That was very exciting to me. You know, how many years did the guy that owned it or the woman that owned it carry it in their pocket? Did they hand it down to their son or their grandkid? You know, what were their story? You know, what, what did that knife, if that knife had eyes, what would it have seen during that time frame? You know, I was poor, so that was entertainment to me. We didn't have a TV. So uh, what, what were you getting? What were you fishing out? And then what were you actually using them for? Oh, I was a farm kid. I mean, I grew up in West Virginia on a 213-acre farm. We had, uh, oh, I don't know, 100, 120, 130 cattle, uh, beef cattle, and I milked cows morning and night. We put up our own hay. Um, I lived in the woods practically, hunting, fishing, trapping, um, cutting firewood, setting fence posts. I mean, typical things that farm kids do. Um, I couldn't afford a new knife. So I would go to the Friday night auctions and, and, uh, you know, it's like if grandpa passed away, uh, somebody went empty out his top dresser drawer that was full of knives that he'd had forever and they'd run them through the auction. And, you know, they might have a whole bunch of other household garbage in it, but if I seen that old beer steiner or a box with a bunch of old knives in it, I would bid, bid, bid until I, I won it, you know, and then I would take the knives out, run a box through and sell it again. 
Uh, and that's how I kind of started my collecting. You know, I have a whole lot of really old case knives and Shapley hardwares and Cataraugus and you know, names you don't really hear that much nowadays, too, you know. Queen City, which is a yeah. precursor to Queen. Yeah, so, which is it, now no longer or having a bit of a renaissance, but yeah. Yeah, the Slippy's coming back. So, so the yeah, big time. It's coming back to my collection hardcore this past uh, six months or so. Uh, but the whole concept of a knife uh, retaining a story and a history and having a soul is, uh, okay, I take it a little too far by saying it has a soul, but you get my point. Uh, I have, I have, I some say that all the time. All right. <laughs> I have some <laughs> weapons on the wall here from World War II and before. And, uh, you know, I know that they at least were used as field implements. Um, and just knowing that they're hundreds of years old, that they're, you know, over 100 years old and had that use. Uh, means a lot to me. Is that something that uh, carries through in your in your design philosophy these days? Oh yeah, definitely. You know, I've I've had this love relationship with knives from as early as I can remember. You know, I used to steal razor blades out of my dad's razor, and you know, I was just a little kid even before kindergarten, and fiddle on things in the backyard. My mother used to cut the shit out, excuse me, the hell out of herself while she did my laundry. Oh. Um, <laughs> I think I was in kindergarten when my dad gave me my first pocket knife, which was, it was an old salesman sample Barlow that he had ground the edge off of and rounded the tip on so I wouldn't hurt myself. And I, and I, I, he tells me that, you know, the second I got the knife, I went out on the sidewalk and put the tip back on it and sharpened it. <laughs> it's just something that I've had. It's been, you know, some people just born to do something. And fortunately or unfortunately, mine was knives. <laughs> <laughs> it just depends well, on how you look at it. I'm not curing cancer, you know, I'm not like, uh, you know, bringing world peace, but I'm making knives and I'm having fun and I'm enjoying my life. And the world is awesome and my life has been awesome. Well, I mean, you've contributed a lot to the knife world and, uh, um, you know, a lot of people can conjure up your designs in their head, but uh, they might forget that you're responsible for speed safe. You know, like you brought, you you birthed the whole assisted opening um, genre of knives, uh, the field strip technology, that's yours. Work sharp, that's yours. Where does this innovation, where does the spirit of innovation come from? You know, uh, that's, I, I really attribute that to growing up on a farm. Uh, we were, we were pretty poor and there were a lot of people in the family, so you know, when the hay had to come in, the hay had to come in. And if the machine was broken, you had to figure a way to fix it. You couldn't just run down to the store and buy a part. Hmm. So, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And, well, people say that. And so I just kind of, I think as a kid, I just, I just developed that ability. You know, I couldn't buy a dirt bike like the other neighbor kids could. So, um, oftentimes I would, I would go to the trader's guide and buy an old beat up Honda or a Suzuki, you know, something that was in a box for a couple of bucks here and there. And I would put them together, you know, one had a bad engine, one had a bad frame and I would ride around with Yamazukis and Kawa Hondas and stuff. So, you know, I, I just feel like I've always been creative that way. You know, I've always kind of, I wanted to ride dirt bikes with the neighbor kids and I couldn't afford one. So you find a way, right? Yeah. So a lot of people associate you with a style or with a, um, yeah, with a design style. Um, and it's that sort of organic style um, that you have seemed to have made like a sort of concerted effort to, to sort of move away from recently. Where did, the, uh, where did the organic style come from in the first place? And uh, how, how, do you see, how do you see your style evolving as a, as a designer? Hmm. Well, I think initially Stan Fujisaka was my mentor. He's the one that taught me how to make knives. The same with, of course, Les George that you had interviewed earlier. Um, and I never wanted to be on top of anybody. I didn't want to copy anybody's style. I didn't want anybody to think that, oh, Ken Onion stole my this or Ken Onion stole my that. And I live in Hawaii. You know, I mean, I've got dolphins and humpback whales and, and beautiful arcs and curves in nature. So you know, you study a, li study a little bit of the golden ratio, a little uh, Fibonacci principles, and you see a leaf uh, float into the shop, and you find inspiration from things like that, or 
a painting of a dolphin and you're like, wow, that's a cool arc. That's a cool curve. That's a cool uh, shape, you know, and it, and it just hits you in the right way. So I did that for a number of years, but then it became predictable. And I think what I tried to do, I, I feel like I built a box outside of the box, but I still had my own box. And one of the most exciting things for me is being able to be in that little uncomfortable zone just outside of your own box. I mean, you're not in anybody else's box either, but you're just kind of pushing boundaries a little bit. You know, hey, I've used all these French curves. I did all these curves. Let's try to design a knife with a straight edge. And I, and I like to think in theme before I design a knife. So, you know, let's say CRKT will say, hey, Ken, um, we need something in this specific category. Uh, three and a half inch bladed uh, utility knife or urban tactical or whatever the case may be. Well, I could go the video game route where a lot of people are now and they find their inspiration because they played video games for a long time and they have these big clunky wedgy looking knives you know and they're cool and all but you know i've never been the guy that wanted to follow the pack you know i didn't want to get lost in that sea of looking like everybody else so i've always liked to stand on my own in my own in my own box in my own space you know, I feel like your products get more attention when when you think independently of the masses. Well, and you really stand. It's a it's a risk if you're an artist or in an an a, a, an artistic creative realm like designing, and it's a risk to be known for something and to become famous and uh, accomplished for something, and then to change the game because. Uh, people won't recognize you right away, say. You, there might be that fear. So, I mean, that's an artistic risk. But those kind of things tend to pay off. Yeah, but there's a lot of very successful knives in the industry that no one will ever know that I designed. You know, I mean, I've been all over the place. I didn't want to be a, a single-line designer. I wanted to be a broad-based designer. I wanted to open up my world and my horizons a little bit. Yeah. You know, I wanted to be able to cover every, every style, every flavor. So uh, that was important to me. That's still important to me. So you said you design in themes. Like, uh, oh, explain that a little bit. What do you mean by that? So, so Kershaw comes to you, says we need a three and a half inch uh, utility knife. What do you do with that? Well, okay, you just said that. So what's going through your head right now? Uh, you know, uh, drop point and black g10 i guess right so you're actually thinking of every three and a half inch utility bladed utility folder that you've ever seen right so if you were to sit down with a pencil and a paper right now and you were to try to design this knife there's a big chance that uh you would be drawing something that is similar to something somebody else has already done right right because you have this idea in your head of what it's supposed to look like but now if I just, and, and I've done this before, you know, I say this often, very few people take me uh, seriously in this, but I, I, it really helps me. So let's say I take that information and I say, okay, 20th Century Fox just contacted me. They wanted me to design a knife for a movie they're making about the first man space shuttle to Mars, the year's 2050. Okay, now just think a little bit. Do you have visions of those same old generic three and a half inch utility bladed folders in your head or is your mind opened up and you're more creative now and you're thinking what the future might be in that category you, you see what i'm saying yeah. it's just well, how you how your mind is positioned while you're while you're going into that um design phase so do you think okay so i know you're a pen and paper pencil and paper uh designer you draft out your designs on pencil and paper. You and I are of a of similar age and generation. Um, uh, I too like paper <laughs> and pencil. What do you think? Uh, what do you think that lends to the creative uh, to, to the design as opposed to designing everything in CAD? Well, I think the guys with CAD have a better advantage in a lot of ways because they can work in nuances and subtlety that's very difficult to do with pencil. 
Huh. You know, I, I mean, I they can they can say, okay, here's a straight line, and I want to bump the middle of this thing up uh, thirty thousandths, and I want to create an arc. Where with a pencil, um, I might be on top of my old line. It might take me a while to find that. You know what I'm saying? Yes, yes, I do. So yeah. And so well, what I do afterwards, once I get done with my pencil sketch, is I cut out plexiglass templates of that knife. You know, and now I can use these as French curves. Let's say I worked for hours and hours to come up with a certain arc. Um, you know, to f to come out with this exact back end. Um, you know, I have it for eternity. I could use this back end in another design. You know, I could use this front end in another design. I could use this arc here in another design in the future. So, you know, over the years, every one of my knives are archived in these plexiglass templates. And I use this translucent um, white uh, acrylic because I can see through it a little bit. But also because I have all the knives that I've ever designed in these plexiglass templates. I can put them together with a pivot. I can feel them. I know exactly how the blade is going to close up, how it's gonna, what it's going to look like closed, what it's going to look like open, how it feels in my hand. You know, there's so many of those different things. And then when I go to create more knives and design more knives, I can use them or I can completely stay organic and free. It's my choice. So, but now I've got hundreds and hundreds of these things that I can just dig through and say, well, I really like the curve on the back of this knife that I did in 2012. You know, I'm creating a new knife, but I still like that back. And or it's I your like own very... It's your own very personalized stencil, and it's like your whole design vocabulary captured in all of those, and you can kind of, you kind of mix them around, uh, you know, if if the yeah, sizes yeah. work. Yeah, exactly. Wow. It works great for me, um, and you know, I started this thing before the whole CAD campaign. Uh, there was computer aided drafting, but it was really, really difficult to learn. Uh, we didn't have like, I mean. Titanium was something that was brand new and it was difficult to find. Screw hardware, pivots, things like that. Nobody was making those for the knife industry. You had to hunt and find certain things to make your own or modify something to work. So, you know, we were we were very analog back when I started, and I guess I, I still am. That's my comfort spot. But the cool thing is, is after I get done doing the sketches, um, then... I just take the papers in the house and we scan them in. And my buddy, Jeff Park, who's a, a hell of a knife maker in his own right, he's been with me for 15 years. I sat with him and we do the CAD drawings um, and we refine the knife. You know, the first things we do is we focus on the lock bar, the stop pin, the pivot shaft. And then we make sure the knife closes properly, you know, that there's not any rear of the blade sticking out we don't have some kind we you know it's not a big ham sandwich in the pocket the knife's got to look really clean and beautiful closed and open in my mind uh, i don't want detent balls sticking out when the blade's open or even when the blade is halfway open i don't want you know i don't want pivot shafts or pivots too low or too close to the to the lock bar because there's too much compound leverage you end up with lock failure so it's it's really important for me to kind of just I mean, we'll spend hours and hours just refining a design. And, and the cool thing there is once we get it done, of course, we copy it and we, you know, we print out a um, uh, uh, copy of it. And then we will cut new templates of that knife. And then we feel them and we have them and we play with them and make sure they're all cool. Now we have a platform to put the clip on and we can play with different textural elements or different sculpting on the knife, you know, to kind of bring it to life. Add so, that I mean, flavor. Are, are you? Are, do you actually end up making it in steel and titanium and and all the materials that it will end up being uh, down the road, or are you designing knives at such a rate that, and and with such experience and background that you're not personally prototyping everything? How does that work? No, I hands on everything. You know, I do all the freehand grinding, do all the heat treating, all the surface grinding. I'm involved in the CAD cam. I'm involved in the machining. Jeff runs the CNC. He does the CAD work, but I'm on okay. top of him. I'm a little bit of a control freak that way. Um, and then we do. We go straight to prototypes. And that's something that a lot of people don't understand. I have to design, you know, 8 to 12 new knives a year on average. 
so when we start making these knives, and this is refining them, doing all the CAD work on them, building the fixtures for them, uh, we'll make three or four or ten of any given model. Um, and then one, one of those knives plus the CAD file goes directly to CRKT or whoever I'm working with, and the other knives are sold as customs, but they're all essentially prototypes. Yeah. And then um, I don't do that model anymore. I discontinue that model and keep moving forward mm -hmm. because they don't have time to make those models anymore. Wow, that must make your prototypes, your handmade prototypes uh, or handmade customs of these so valuable because they're, you're only producing 10 of them by, you know, with your hands. And or then, three or four, yeah. Or three or four, man. So man, you, I still freehand grind. Everything's freehand. I don't use jigs or crutches or any of that kind of stuff. You know, we do all our own heat treating. We do our own cryogenics here, our own machine work. You know, everything is made by hand. I mean, we cut out the profiles with the CNC, but the rest is done by hand. So you mentioned Jeff Park, and if I'm not mistaken, he's he's the guy who made the crossbones, right? Is that his right. knife? Right. Okay. Yes. I mean, so obviously he he is a knife maker of with severe chops. Ah, <laughs> very nice. This is the mini mini uh, mini bones. CRKT calls it crossbones because he put the cross. And, and you know and all that on there but it's just bones to us right that is a sweet there we go i like it when this one here we've actually changed it we've got it contoured so it's not as boxy as the old one plus we did this new uh flange lock we kind of playing around with here in the shop so it's oh. kind of cool instead of having a big cutout for a frame lock we're using this flange lock and it's a much cleaner much easier to get to uh, style for us can you uh, turn it one more uh, around so I can see the thumb axis, just since you have it there? Look at that. That's beautiful. Well, so, so Jeff Park, so you have, would you consider yourself his mentor? I know it's very important to you at this stage in your career to start passing along knowledge, <laughs> insight, experience uh, onward. Is Jeff Park one of the people that you've done that to? Yeah, definitely. I mean... Jeff was a collector. He used to come over and hang out and, and collect my knives for years. And he sold insurance, um, delivered art, things of that nature. He, he really had no, no hand skills, so to speak, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I had another guy that was working in a shop, named, a guy named Wally. Well, he passed away. He was like 30 and he passed away. And I had this new CNC machine and I had spent like 30 grand on Mastercam software and and uh, you know, Mastercam solids and all this Mastercam art, all these different softwares. And I was trying to figure them out. And uh, Jeff, he's a Punahou grad. He, uh, he went to school with a Barack Obama. Yeah. So, I mean, he's a smart guy. And he just kept coming over to the shop. He knew, he knew I needed the help. So I just started paying him. Uh, and he never left. So... <laughs> become you know best friend and and just a, he's a great guy a great knife maker and he's learned so much you know he's a he's a he's a, a hell of a knife maker so i'm really proud of him so what kind of responsibility do you feel towards the next generation of knife makers or or people just uh you know on the rise right now how do you how do you approach uh you know, at the knife shows and, and those kind of events, how do you approach people and um, help them along without being, you know, overly advice? Like, how does well, that I work? I don't go out saying that, hey, you know, I've got all the answers. Come talk to me. I'm the big guy on the hill kind of a thing. It's not like that. Oftentimes I'm at the shows and maybe I'll go out back for a smoke break or something. And I'll have a couple of guys come up and start talking, introduce themselves, start talking to me. And they say they're a relatively new knife maker. They've been at it for a little while. And they're like, well, hey, man, how did you do this? And, and I've been trying to get into that, and I don't know how to do this. And, and so I just kind of take them under my arm a little bit. If they seem really enthusiastic and they want to really learn and they're legit, then I give them my cell phone number. It's like anytime you need to, you're having a problem, give me a call. I'll help you, I'll help you work through it. Uh, or they'll come into my shop and we'll work for a couple of weeks. We'll fly over here and spend a week or two here, whatever it is. I mean, we've done that dozens of times. You'd be surprised. 
How has it uh, changed in 30 years, right? 30 years you've been doing this? <laughs> yeah. It's changed a lot. Uh, I, I tell you, sometimes I go to a nice show and I feel like a stranger. And, 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 and don't take this wrong. This doesn't come from an ego place, but I feel like a stranger in my own house. Mm, you know? Yeah. Because I feel like I helped build it, you know? Whether I did or not, but that's what I feel. Uh, when I came in, the knife industry was relatively small. I feel like SpeedSafe really helped the knife industry grow. Uh, there was a lot of dead space in the knife industry. There wasn't much innovation in the knife industry at all. The coolest new thing was the, the frame locker, the, the liner lock, and titanium. So when SpeedSafe came along, why, we just started kicking everybody's ass. So, so all the other it... companies came out, and they, they're like, oh, well, we've got to innovate. And I think the, the, the 10 years after SpeedSafe was introduced was one of the most creative and robust growth times for the knife industry ever. And, and what I was do... the need? What was the need? Well, how did how did SpeedSafe come about? I mean, it really did take it. It seemed like everyone was like, oh, yeah, of course, everyone started doing it. So what was what was the need that we were lacking before SpeedSafe? <clears throat> Well, like I said, I, I mentored with Stan Fujisaka. And Stan Fujisaka made these really beautiful gentleman folders. And his actions were incredibly smooth. And, and you know, I was just sitting around thinking one day, wow, you know, how can I make a knife that's smoother than Stan's? And it just dawned on me, well, the only way I could make one smoother is if it had some kind of an assist. So, I don't know, I pondered that for a few months, thought about it, and then it's, this friend of mine came over to the shop and she had bought a cam for a Harley and it was a wrong size or, you know, it was a wrong year or whatever, what have you. And she asked me if I could machine it for her and, you know, trim it so it would work. And all she said was cam and it just rushed in on me. So I went over to a manila folder and I just started sketching, 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 sketching. And then I came back, did her job, got her out of the shop and, and for the next 36 hours, I worked on knives. I, I, I built two prototypes and I was kind of tickled with them. They were really strong assists. I mean, they were super powerful. I didn't have them dialed in at that time, but I went over to Stan's house and we pinky promise that, you know, we did the, you know, I don't tell anybody this is confidential. And I just wanted his opinion because of course, you know, mad respect for Stan. He was my sensei and I handed him one of the knives and, and, and he flipped it a couple of times and he's like, dang, Ken, I think you're onto something. I'm like, really? He says, yeah. He says, you ought to think about getting a patent on this. I'm like, you know, I was thinking the same thing. But I'd never gotten a patent. I didn't know how to do that. How do you find a patent attorney? What do you, what do you, what do, you do to, to, to get a patent? What does a patent cost? So it, it took a little trial and error. And luckily, my intellectual property guy, my patent attorney, happened to be an intellectual property um, attorney for NASA. His name was oh. Tim Bickham, and I hired him. My speed safe patent was like fourteen thousand seven hundred dollars or something like that. I was, I was un, I wasn't unemployed, but I was on uh, workman's comp because I had destroyed my back in an industrial accident, uh, and I was going through a bunch of back surgeries at that time. And you know, it was scary because I had young kids, and I was wondering, well, how am I supposed to? Uh, make a living with this destroyed back. I mean, I'm a, I'm an industrial mechanic. I'm a machinist. I work at a refinery. That's a tough job. Mm. And I, you know, you got those little kids looking at you and, and you're struggling to be able to make the mortgage payments and you're doing everything you can to provide for your family. And, it, and, and, but your back is destroyed. You're just in pain. I mean, I remember two days out of the hospital from back reconstruction surgery with a walker. I'm in a shop grinding knives in boxer shorts and a shop apron because uh, I couldn't stand to have the waistband on my back. It was just driving me crazy. But there was a desperation to be able to provide for my family. What happens if I can't do this career that I've chosen that I've already spent, you know, 20 some years in or 15 years in at that? I don't even remember. Um, and so I had to be really creative. I had to think of, well, how can I compete with the people that live in the lower 48, if I'm in Hawaii, it costs twice as much for the materials and supplies to get here. The real estate is two, three, four times more expensive. The cost of electricity is more expensive. I can't sell knives at the same price that other guys can and make any profit whatsoever. So I had a complete 
disadvantage. So what could I do? Invent something. Get a factory contract. Make numbers in volume. Or make, make royalties in, in volume. And fortunately, that's what happened. I mean, it, it couldn't have happened any... I, I mean, if I didn't get the contract when I got the contract, I would have lost my house. I would have been sure. broke. I'd have been living under a bridge somewhere. So it was Speed Safe that opened the door to Kershaw for you. It was that innovation. Right. Okay, you right. came to them with well, that. I, had, I, no, I, I, I came to Buck. I came to Benchmade. I came to all kinds of companies. And they would pat me on the head like, you know, hey, you know, good job, young man. But we, we're our factories in California. That's obviously Switchblade. Uh, and I went through all the all the revised statutes. I went through the federal laws. I went through the state laws. I went through Canadian laws. I went through European laws. You know, I, I studied the law. And there's no way that the, that the switchblade law matched what I was doing. You know, a switchblade knife is defined as a knife that opens via manual pressure applied to a button spring or other mechanism contained in the handle. And mine didn't do that. I was applying manual force to the blade. It met more of the definition of a one-handed knife than an automatic. So I knew they were wrong. You know, it's amazing how many people that work regular jobs or knife makers or, you know, the guy that changes your tires at the Goodyear have opinions on legal matters. <laughs> yeah, right. No, no legal experience. So I just felt like, God damn it, I'm an American. I live in a free country. I'm not going to be bullied around. I think I really got something here. And luckily it worked out. I mean, that patent just expired in January of last year. Wow. And it, it stood the test of time. It was a 20-year patent. I got to say, I'm really surprised that, uh, that it was allowed to happen, uh, even though the statutes may have um, basically stated that it was legal. I'm surprised it was allowed to be legal, you know, without a, just because of the optics. Oh, it comes out with a spring. It's so fast. You know, we, we got to let this danger. We got to write this into the already existing and Byzantine law, you know, I'm surprised yeah. that didn't happen. Oh, they tried a bunch of times. I mean, that, yeah. to Kershaw's benefit, um, they sent their legal team to Texas, to California. I mean, every time somebody got pulled over for drunk driving and they found that they had one of my knives on their hip, they would try to charge them for an automatic knife. Well, Kershaw's lawyers weren't defending the guy for drunk driving, but they were defending the fact that they were trying to classify his knife as an automatic knife because it didn't meet the, the definition as contained in the criminal code. So, you know, to their benefit, they sent, they sent millions of dollars defending the speed safe. Wow. So when you do uh, an assisted knife for CRKT, do you, how do you design that? If you've already designed one for Kershaw and it's automatic or not automatic. I'm sorry. It's assisted with speed safe. Do you do, do you then do auto um, uh, assisted with other companies and use a different mechanism? No, it's the same mechanism. Remember now speed safe expired January last year. So it's public domain right now. Okay. It's no longer patented. The patent's expired. So essentially anybody can make the assist. Right. Uh, but, CRKT didn't make my assist um, until just recently, until after the uh, um, the patent had expired. Okay, so you're also known for field strip. That was that's another of your major innovations. Um, that is the ability to. It, it's a mechanism on the knife that allows you to take it apart. It's a very simple mechanism. Field strip it, clean it out, put it back together. And, and you're good to go. Was this always something that you felt a need and something uh, like a like a gun, like a pistol you can take apart without tools usually? Same sort of thing? Well, I've been working on the take apart knife since like 2006. I mean, it's, it's taken a long, it's been a long journey to get to, especially just to get, just to get somebody to actually do it. There's so many people think that they don't need a knife to take apart or that somehow it's going to be mechanically flawed because you can take it apart. But my name's been on millions of knives that have been sold over the last couple decades. And let me tell you how many, I, I get so many knives in my shop from people that think because my name's on it, I should be the one that cleans it and modifies it and adjusts it and tidies it up for them. Right. And the things that I have found in people's pocket knives would turn your stomach. I mean, it's just, 
I mean, people don't realize that just because you wipe off the blade don't mean the knife is clean. Yeah. If you're using it for fishing and gutting trout, you know, and then you skin your deer with it, and then you put peanut butter on your crackers with it at lunch, um, and then you dig dig around in your in your potted plants, uh, you know, that stuff builds up after a while. And some of it is, and you know, then you sweat on it for, for a couple of years. Yeah. There's some vile stuff in people's pocket knives. And it dawned on me that, you know, these guys are over in Iraq and Afghanistan. If, if, if their rifle hits the ground, they can take it apart and clean it right there in the field. And they don't have any small parts that's gonna, they're going to lose and render their, their rifle inoperable. So I knew that I had to make this thing so it didn't have a bunch of little parts that you could lose. Yeah. Um, but I thought it would be great to have the ability to just disassemble your knife and rinse off in the stream or creek or clean it up. I mean, I've had people send me hundreds and hundreds of knives over the years just to clean them up for them because they were afraid to take them apart. Mm. So it was a necessity. And, and I think that's kind of where my brain is when it comes to innovating or thinking of new things for a knife. You know, uh, when it came up with the assisted category of knives, I thought it was a cool thing. You know, something that 400 years of pocket knife making nobody had done. Right. But then other companies jumped on board and they started trying to find ways around my assist. And they wanted to have their own assist. Well, there's already assist in the market. You know, and yeah. Kershaw had to spend millions of dollars. And I traveled all over the place giving testimony and all kinds of things. And, and these guys are just kind of getting a free ride. Doesn't cost them anything to steal my intellectual property and, and, and try to take part of my market share. Well, that kind of that kind of didn't settle right with me. It didn't settle right with Kershaw. And, and I think that it would have been better for these guys to focus their attention on something that wasn't in the knife. I mean, what can you do to a pocket knife to make it a better experience by using it? You know, you carry these things in your pocket all the time. You want one to open faster. You want a better, a more secure pocket clip. You want a pocket clip that you don't have to feel. Um. What about taking one apart and being able to clean it real quick? You know, there's there's so many areas that have been unexplored in a pocket knife. And and I just think that there's there's still there's still a lot of room to play there. So there's you, still you a talk, lot of room to innovate. You talked about necessity, you know, necessity uh, being the mother of invention in this case, yeah. You need to take it apart, get that gunk out of the knife, but you also mentioned how your you know you have millions of knives out there with your name on them and and i i don't think that they are in those mil in those millions of hands strictly because of the necessity there is also uh, a flip side a yin to the yang and it's like fashion in a way it's like looking at the culture and figuring out what people want and kind of predicting trends and i think you've been pretty good at that do you have any insight into whether that's true yeah that's trajectory that's very deliberate you know if you study where the knife industry's been i mean let's go back to the 60s and 70s and then you carry it forward every five years of what innovations what things were coming out new i mean you can essentially follow this arc this curve right and so all all it really takes is a creative mind and the ability to just close your eyes and say, well, if this is the path that it's going on, why don't I just jump ahead a year or two? Why don't I just have, uh, jump ahead a, a decade? You know? So I think that's, that's a little bit of what I do, too. And I, I like to study demographics on the computer. I like to see what's trending, what's selling, um, what companies' products are their number one selling products, um, what are the consumers asking for. And I get on those forums. I don't post very often. But I do read, and it all goes into a bank. And after a while, it starts making sense. This is what this is what people are asking for. This is what people want. I, and sometimes I agree with them. Sometimes I don't. So what like are the this, innovations by? Oh, sorry. What were you going to say? I mean, right now we've got this ambiguous trend in knives where everything's are you know everybody likes a real flat, plain handles, very simplistic designs. Uh, you know, I mean, it doesn't take very long before. And don't get me wrong, I enjoy carrying those kind of knives. The, 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 there's just the market saturated with them. So, okay, let's look at the sporting world and let's look at the fashion world and let's look at uh, what's trending globally as far as 
the next generation's ideas of what is cool. And for me, I, I think vintage is coming in in a big way. I think it's been here for a couple of years, but I think it's picking up momentum. So, you know, let's play with some of these some of these vintage textures, these vintage lines a little bit. And, and not going back to the classics necessarily, but just still maintaining a little bit of that classic flavor, taking them old classic designs and, and adding that. And then what we're talking about with the soul of the knife, I think there's so many knives out there that are gorgeous, but they don't feel like they have soul in them. It was one of the reasons I like to play in theme. Um, you know, so imagine 1940s and it's Christmas Day and you're opening up your, well, say you're much older than what you are. And you're opening up that Christmas present on your 10th birthday. And it's that, it's that uh, Roy Rogers pocket knife. You know, see, we've got a little theme going there, right? I mean, Roy Rogers was really cool. And, and, and I mean, that knife meant the world to you or whoever this kid was back in the day. And it had soul and it had presence. It had something. So to be able to do that in 2021, to be able to come up with a knife that is just as exciting for some kid on his 10th birthday or his 10th, you know, 10th year at Christmas, he's 10 years old and it's Christmas day. I, I think is would be a really, really fun, cool thing. And something that he can associate with something that he already thinks is really cool. You know? Well, okay, so we're talking about soul in a knife, and it occurs to me that uh, well, there's a line in the movie Chinatown, which I'm going to paraphrase, but it's like uh, um, politicians, uh, ugly buildings, and whores all get respect if they stick around long enough and it's kind of like the same with a knife if you have a if you have kind of a run-of-the-mill knife but it you carry it and it stays with you for years and years and years and you put a lot of use into it you're going to imbue it with that soul another right. way you're you developing get, the soul there right another way to get instant soul is to buy a custom knife or something that you know has had hand treatment you know in one something way that was loved Yes, exactly. That's and the key. It's not just so much handmade. It's was it loved, you know? Right. And I think that intuitively we know, us knife guys, us guys that really eat, sleep, and breathe knives, know whether that knife has been loved or not, you know? Because so many times you see these knives that just look like an afterthought. You know, it's like, oh, I want to make a knife. So, okay, I'm just going to scratch something on this piece of paper and I'm going to build it. You know, and there's going to be a lot of little things that aren't cool with it. You know, there are going to be a lot of things that are generic. There's going to be a lot of things that ain't right. And when you when you handle that knife, when you see that knife, you feel the soulless, empty vessel that it is. But when you see something that somebody really commiserated over and they made sure that every line was exactly what they perceived as being cool, from the design element to the execution element, I think intuitively, and maybe even maybe even um, subconsciously, we know that. We feel that. We know this thing has been loved. Yes. Yes. And no matter what it is, I mean, you, <laughs> you mentioned the uh, holding it up and it's an empty vessel. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel that uh, I feel that if the design itself is loved and labored over and then produced in some way and it comes to the hand of the user and they like it um yeah you got soul but then what i reflect on is as a collector and uh as sometimes i just go overboard and i have all these knives that could have soul you know and perhaps they had them when they were being designed but they're they're sitting fallow um in my in my tool chest exactly I'm, I'm, i was just gonna go there so you're a passionate guy i'm a really passionate guy um, and, and I think that's what it takes, you know, but, you know, us as, as, as knife collectors, as knife enthusiasts, we have that top dresser drawer of knives. And right. every morning we get up and we open that drawer and we decide what knives are we going to carry today? And we might have 50, we might have a hundred, we might have 200 knives in that, in that top drawer. So why do we carry the same one, two or three every day? What is it about those knives that are so different from all the other cool knives that you have? Why do you choose those knives? Okay. So now as a maker, as a, as a designer, that's what I've tried to do. 
you know, I've tried to, to not just make a cool knife, but make the knife you want to carry every day. Make the one so, that's comfortable. Make the one that makes you feel right. So where does all this obsession with uh, the latest super steel fit into this discussion of soul? I have certain steels that I absolutely love. I'm, I tend to consider myself a steel princess. Um, <laughs> but also it goes overboard quite a bit, you know. Um, honestly, most steels, you know, let's just take the top 10 um, most popular blade steels. If I or somebody else was to make 10 knives utilizing a different steel in each one of these knives and grind them exactly the same, heat treat them exactly the same, or, or you know, the same hardness, the same geometries, the same everything, most people wouldn't be able to tell a dime's worth of difference between these steels, these alloys. But there are a couple exceptions to that. Um, the problem is some of these steels are incredibly expensive. I mean, Takefu, let's say. And I love SG2. That's one of my favorite steels in the world. Great precision to cutting steel. You know, I love these nitrogen alloys, but they're expensive. Are you going to jack the price up on that knife an extra hundred bucks because that steel? Right. You know, so and, 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 and it doesn't mean they're going to polish great either. It doesn't mean that their fit and finishes your your finish is going to be great on them, although you can with that. But there's just. Yeah, so many guys are like, hey, I really like this. I like the vanadium in this. You know, it holds a really long edge. But then you find out, well, hey, yeah, it holds a great edge, a great medium edge, because those vanadium carbides are so big that they only come into play when a knife is already half dull. You know, I like those nitrogen steels where they, they nitride the chromium molecule in the steel, and the chromium molecule is much smaller than the nitrogen or than, uh, than the uh, vanadium. So that'll stack up on that cutting edge a lot better. So now you've got, if done right, you've got a knife that keep that really nice high-end um, razor-sharp edge for longer than most. And that's what I care about, that, that, that super keen edge. You know, I don't, once, once it's half dull, I'm resharpening it. So, how, okay. So right now, I feel like uh, the knife world... There is so much more now than there has ever been. And I've been collecting knives kind of avidly uh, for, say, 20 years, let's say. And then I was always interested beforehand, collected what I could, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but only in the last, say, five years have I been able to afford things with, exo not exotic, but expensive steels and, and that kind of thing. And um, there is a fascination that comes with that uh, um, knowing that the steel that I'm barely going to use for anything, but that if I did, it would be capable of so, so much. Uh, I think, I think that's a, that's a, that's a huge part of it. But um, like you said, it can be expensive. So are there other things that maybe knife makers who are coming up, who want to differentiate themselves, uh, but might be tempted to go in the way of exotic materials and stuff like that? What else can they do? To sort of, I mean, it seems like a very tough business, and I'm sure it's you've getting seen tougher. It. That's for sure. The so, Chinese are kicking our butt, you know. I mean, my hats off to them, much respect, but they're kicking our butts, you know. I mean, what's what Riot and Reich's doing um, are oftentimes better than a lot of the handmade knives out there. The engineering is superior in a lot of ways. I hate saying that, but it is the truth, you know. So. You know, America's got to get its act together. I, I would say, actually, um, there's a certain charm in the in the um, in the in the handmadeness of a of a custom knife that you will not get in the perfection of a Riot knife, for instance. Um, you won't get the soul, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so there are there are trade offs there. There is, but what about the knife companies, the big knife companies in America? I think those are the ones uh, that need to kind of step up a little bit more uh, the custom makers are the custom makers they're doing everything by hand and 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 the only real concern are the are the people who are buying their knives they're the ones who are concerned but you have a whole wide population buying from these giant companies um are they going to start stepping it up uh, to riot levels or that kind of thing is is that what you're suggesting uh, it would be nice especially if they're doing them in-house it would be nice that they did but there's no way that they could compete dollar for dollar. I mean, Chris Reeves has done a good job. 
but he builds, you know, that factory only makes a couple different models. Right. You know, and they're they're consistent, and they're uniform, and they're great. But they're still more expensive than the Riots and the Rikes and the Kaisers and the Tubelos and you know, fill in the blank. Wee's Wee's doing a great job out there. Um, I don't know. I I don't know if it's possible to compete on an even keel there. Hmm. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the factories, um, well, all the big production factories are going through the the old format of sales, right? I mean, they sell their products to a distributor for the most part. The distributor sells it to a wholesaler. The wholesaler sells it to a retailer. Um, so you just got to figure the knife gets stepped on a little bit, right? So one of the keys is being able to find a way to get the product to the consumer without being stepped on as much. So then how do you inspire the next generation? How do you fill them, put wind in their sails to keep going on? Uh, what do you suggest? What are your, what's your advice to young knife makers? Um, the key is innovation. You've got to be able to innovate. You've got to be creative. You've got to, you've got to bring the, the, your product to the next level. You can't just do the same things that everybody else is doing. Don't follow trends. Um, stay positive, stay focused. Go like hell, man. I mean, study your industry, study the marketplace, study the competition, and find your niche, find your slot, find where you belong in the, in, in, in the industry, and then pursue that with everything you got. Okay, you say don't follow trends. To me, like the, the first thing that popped into my head was uh, trends are what's popular. How do you navigate that? You know, because you do want to innovate, you do need to take risks. You need, to, you do need, you do need to, you know. All right, but if somebody says, "Okay, I want to design a tactical folding knife," and like we just did in the exercise a little while ago, you start thinking of tactical folding knife, and now you've got a mental picture of all the tactical folding knives you've ever seen running through your head. Um, most guys, to stay in that trend, are going to design something comparable to something they've already seen. They're going to piss off other knife makers that they're on top of. You know, they're, they're going to have difficulty making their way in the game because they're not really going to get the support that people that, that you would think that they would normally get if they were in their own lane. Um, and there's ways to do that, that tactical or military style folder without being on top of everybody. Mm. You know, do your own thing. And that's why I always encourage people to think in theme. Create a storyline, create something, but just get outside of the box of doing the same thing that everybody else is doing. Right. And that's how you stand out, right? And you can have endless variations on a theme, you know, uh, uh, you can, that, that can sustain you through a, a, a long period of creativity. Right. If, if you just, if you were at the airport and everybody was wearing black and then one person in the middle was wearing white, which one would stand out the most? The guy wearing white, right? So I'm just saying, you know, f find a way to make your product stand out. Don't just get lost in that sea of black and silver. You know, it's important. Even like this little home front. Well, this is the little one, but the home front. TRKT says, hey, Ken, we need to design a, uh, like a combat folder, a tactical folder. You know, I went vintage with it. Why? Yeah. Because I didn't want to be in the same lane as everybody else. I know that younger generation are thinking, hey, I'm kind of like in vintage now. Us older folks are like, hey, that's right in my lane. That reminds me of, of, of whatever. And, and, and our grandfathers are like, yeah, that reminds me of WW2. So now you have a big, broad audience, right? So it's just more analyzing the situation, thinking through what it is you want to design and where to place that design and how to stand out in the game, right? Very important. And not just be weird. You still have to maintain practicality. Right, right. You still have to maintain ergonomics. It still has to be a usable piece. So I, I'm sorry. I, I, I feel sometimes, um, uh, and and this is not a bad thing at all, but I feel sometimes designers get very artistic, and then the companies that produce their work get very excited at the challenge. You know, this has never been engineered like this before. Let's do it. Even though it's not necessarily something you want to have in your pocket when you're backpacking. Mm -hmm. And to me, there's definite value in that. It, it's, you know, even, 
you know, that in and of itself is an innovation because it's it's pushing limits, certain limits. But um, what innovations by other makers do you really resonate with that you uh, respect? I'm mean, looking at Caswell's Karambit. Oh, yes. Right? Yes. Look the, at Flavio Acoma's Deadbolt. Have you ever seen a stronger lock in your life? You know, I have I mean, not uh, hefted the Deadbolt. What's that? I have not used the Deadbolt yet. I love the concept. It's too. You should get one. You, you, should, <laughs> you should get one because I'm telling you, it's very difficult to harm that lock. It, it's a lock that won't slip. It's, it's, you know, I've watched Flavio beat the hell out of one of those things trying to, trying to harm the lock and he just ended up breaking the blade. All right. And he just, you know, he's got two big posts that go all the way through and, and lock that blade in place. He, he's a brilliant designer. Um, innovator, uh, incredible. I mean, that's one of the things that I love to do now that, you know, I'm not, I'm not really trying to be super competitive in the knife world. Like I once did, you know, when I was a younger man, I was trying to make my mark and there's a lot of young men out there that are, you know, they're aggressive. They're, they're trying to make their mark in the industry. That's wonderful. That's excellent. That's passion. That's exactly what the knife industry needs. But I get to run through the knife shows and I get to study the forums and the Instagrams and stuff. And I get to go out and I see, I see who is, who is really innovating, who is really creative, who really needs that break, who, who really needs, you know, to, to be encouraged to push it just a little bit farther, just keep going, you know, and oftentimes I'll interject myself into those scenarios a little bit, you know, and if it's welcome, then fine. If it's not welcome, that's fine too. But, you know, these are the guys that are going to be shaking and moving the game in the future, I feel. So reading, reading the field with your eyes and your experience, what would you say, uh, where would you say we're headed in the next five years? What will be the major trends in the knife world? Wow, that's tough. That's one of the problems, with, well, I wouldn't say it's a problem. You know, the, the knife industry oftentimes goes in, a direction and and right now i can't say that there is any one specific big trend there's a whole bunch of things happening some guys like the really big combative knives right now we're seeing a big trend in the and the slim gentleman's knife you know like the bones here like uh richard rogers ceo yeah. um some of these slim smaller knives uh, some people are going vintage the slip joints are coming back. Some people are taking the old slip joints and turning them into IKBS flippers. And I think those are all really cool. But this is one of the first times in the knife world where we have multiple things happening at the same time. And because of this COVID thing, there is a certain saturation point. There's a lot of knife makers out there that now have CNCs and are capable of doing large volumes of knives in the course of a year. Um, and as a result, do we have enough buying public to, to, to keep these knives constantly moving? And from what I can see, we're right at that cusp of being slightly oversaturated. So I would like to encourage companies and knife makers to not do as many designs but take the key designs that you're developing in a year and focus on refining these things until they're really, really well engineered and stop just trying to throw shit against the wall and see what sticks. Yeah. And, and, you know, I don't mean to harm anybody in that, but that's what I see. I see that it's just like, you know, each one of these companies coming out with 30, 40, 50 new products a year. It's yeah. not necessary. And they don't have, they can't spend marketing dollars on them. Um, and so a lot of them get, get lost because when they came out, they handed out a flyer and somebody posted a picture on Instagram. And a month later, nobody even knows it exists. Right. So focus on the amount of knives and the style of knives and the new products that you have the ability to market successfully. Make sure that those knives are absolutely refined and dialed in and are exactly what you want before you start offering it. There's so many halfway thought out products in the market. You see it, I see it. A lot of people won't say it. I'm not going to 
mention any 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 anybody, any company, any anything. But I just think they're doing themselves a disservice. Um, I, on the positive that, end of that thought, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. On the positive end of that thought, I have always thought that CRKT in particular does a great job of coming out with a million knives every year, but each one is like designed by a designer and and or a knife maker and and they seem to do a really good job of keeping it interesting, keeping it fresh. Um, and I know a lot of people don't buy them more because knife snobs want different materials. But yeah. the fact- Oh, the you fact put AUS-8 in and I'm not gonna buy it because it's AUS-8 or made in China, yeah. made in Taiwan. But, but I, fact, I would challenge any other company to keep up with CRKT's innovation. And, and they're making a lot of knives that people want to carry. And people, most people don't wanna spend a lot of money for that knife. So I, I, think I agree. They've got the they've got a good a good recipe there. I, I agree, but I just think the whole knife industry would be much better served if we did just okay. Let's just slow it down a little bit and let's refine. Let's make sure that we're refined. So as you move, and I'm talking custom maker all the way through to factory maker. Just refine that product and make sure it is dialed in. So I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, as you move forward now. And in your in your your, um, it seems like you can you can harness this interest in reading the culture for design and come up with some other kind of cool EDC stuff or you know uh, manly accoutrement kind of stuff. Is that an interest for you to to branch out beyond knives? Yeah, I've thought about it. I don't know. I mean, the tools have always interested me. And I've always thought it would be cool to be involved in some sort of a um, creating new tools. You know, I'm a, I'm a ranch head. I, I work on my own stuff. You know, I've got tools everywhere. Every time there's a new cool tool out, i got to pick one up if, it's, if it makes sense. But even in that arena, there's just a lot of halfway thought out products, you know, that right. you think they're cool and you might pick it up, but it doesn't really work with a darn. So, okay. Yeah. So without revealing too much Tell us, uh, as we wrap here, tell us where your head is at for uh, your future designs, designs that you're working on right now that are going to be coming out soon. And I'm not asking you to divulge anything, but what are the kind of themes or, you know, what are you thinking about as you work on the stuff we will be seeing, say, next year? <clears throat> I'm, just, I'm just trying to stay, like, refined, well thought out, the knife that you want to carry, not that you just think is really cool and have to buy. Um, I have a couple of bullets left in my gun. I, I think I could still throw a couple of in, new inventions out there that I think people will catch on to and, and enjoy, uh, just to round out the whole process of carrying a pocket knife, to, to refine the, the carrying a knife, using a knife, opening and closing that knife. Um, I, I'm a fidgety guy. I like you know, if I'm watching TV, oftentimes I have my pocket knife out and I'm rolling around in my hand. That's why you notice most of my knives have a textural element to them. Um, because I like that feel factor. I like rolling them around. And I think a lot of people like doing that. And that's what Speed Safe was really cool. It was just flick, 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 flick. I mean, everybody did that. It wasn't so much about, oh, I'm going to harm somebody with this deadly switcheroo assist knife, right? It was just more fidget factor. It was cool. So... Playing on just just playing on experience with a knife, Ex you know the joy of carrying and using a knife, um, broadening out that scope a little bit, refining that process a little bit more. Uh, you know, innovations and, and inventions usually take a while to bring to life. It, mm -hmm. It's easy to kind of just make it work. It's another thing to kind of reduce it down to its lowest common denominator, refine it, make sure it's durable make sure it's manufacturable um and there's several stages of that process I, I neglected to ask you when we were talking about the field strip that there is a field strip too there's a a, a rehash of the field strip um what was tell me what was behind the the, the need for that oh that's a nice looking knife how did that this come is bona fide you know bona fide it's off an old cigar pattern kind of playing around with the vintage flavoring a little bit mm -hmm. What was the thought in this? Yeah. Um, well, the original speed safe, or uh, speed safe, field strip, had that lever on the front that a lot of people thought was a lock release. 
and instead it released the front end of the knife. Um, they couldn't see a wheel in the back, and it just took too much of a learning curve to get people to figure it out, which I kind of liked. I, n I never really intended to be able to tear apart the knife in, in 2.2 seconds. Right, right. You know, the whole idea was to be able to take it apart it's, and put it back together and with no tools and still keep the knife very, very rigid. Um, the beauty of this is they actually do have the captured IKBS bearings in it. Uh, uh, the, the take apart is really, really quick. But, you know, this is something that I tried to get on the original uh, home front is these captured bearings. You know, these can't come out. And they're embedded in the blade itself. That's so they're, cool. Yes, they're, they're inset into the blade, but then there's a, a, a tube that goes through the middle, right. and it's flared on both ends slightly. So the bearings can still roll. Right. You know, oh and up. it works really, really well. And the, the cool thing is, is, you know, rinse it off in a stream or creek or whatever you want to do. Uh, get all the, all the weirdness out of it. And if you need to, put a little deer grease on it, you know, hit it yeah, with some yeah. fat on your, on your animal carcass or, or what have you. And it's all lubed up and ready to go. So are those bearings going to end up in the, um, in the original style field strip as well? Uh, I'm working on that. Okay. I've been, I've been, uh, dancing up and down and trying to say, please, 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 please to CRKT, but we'll see what they do. <laughs> well, they don't, uh, they don't always listen, you know, and, and I'm kind of like that little yappy dog that's just on their heels all the time. That's, that's <laughs> exactly what you reminded me of a, a little yappy dog. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I think they're going to kick me the hell out. <laughs> Ken, this is not your company. You don't own this company. <laughs> yeah, but but please design all of our knives. Thank you very much. Well, that's the one thing. Every company that I've ever worked with, you know, I take it as a as a big responsibility. I take it as a big honor. Yeah. You know, and they don't just get designs; they get me, and I'm in their face. You know. <laughs> nice. I, well, you know, they sometimes they listen, times sometimes they don't, but I'm in their face. Ken you Onion, know. it's been a pleasure, sir. Thank I you very much. Oh, I, I appreciate you coming on, taking the time to talk to us. I know a lot of people uh, who watch and listen to the show are going to be thrilled that you came on. And uh, I, I feel like we have so much more to talk about. There's so many uh, things I haven't asked you. Maybe maybe we'll get another opportunity in the future. Uh, but it was a pleasure having you on the show, sir. Thank you very much. It was an honor for me. I appreciate it. All right, I hope, I hope it was insightful. I hope it was good. You know, we'll, we'll see. I, I think from you, we get so much experience and so much, uh, you know, so much uh, insight from the years you've put in and the innovations you brought that uh, everyone can get something. So I appreciate yeah, it, and sir. Just stay positive, man. Just stay positive and focused, you know, go for the goal, go for the gusto. Uh, uh, that's all it takes. Hard work and, and, and study, think and strategy. It's like Monopoly, man. It's like Monopoly. Strategize. Take care, man. Thanks All for right. having me. Thank you, you have a wonderful All day, right. Bob. You mm. too, sir. Take care. Ever strop a knife again, even though it gets no real use? Face up to what you are. You're a knife junkie. Well, you heard it from the man himself. Go for the gold. Innovate. Really try and think differently. Um, you know, advice we can scale to our own lives, even if we're not knife makers. So uh, I, I'm honored. To, I'm honored Ken Onion came on the show. It was a pleasure speaking with him. And uh, make sure that you you check us out. Check out all of our other podcasts here on the Knife Junkie podcast and on the YouTube channel. And uh, well, we will see you here next week. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.